Welcome to another Melbourne Cocoa Heads presentation. Recorded live, April 14th, 2011. In this session, Chris Miles demonstrates a media-rich iPad application he has developed for clothing retailer Jeans West. So today I'm just going to talk to you about a, an app I did um, recently for Jeans West, an iPad app. Um, it's an app that they um, originally, the, plan, the scope of the app was to deploy in their stores. They, have, they want to have iPads in their stores for customers to come in, um, just have a novel way of browsing the products and, and filtering in on different styles of, of jeans and that sort of stuff. So this is just sort of a quick demo of the, of the app and uh, talk about a couple of the challenges that I um, had to, I guess, overcome to, get to, to produce it for them. So um, I'll just start by demoing the app itself. See you have an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, it's not available in the App Store yet, that's something they, I think that they're planning to do. Um, so you can't really see it, but anyway, it started on a looping video, and if you do, you know, if you pick it up, then it uh, jumps into the main UI, which is what we've got here. Um, what they've gone for, it, the, you know, the idea of the app is pretty simple, you really just, they've got a bunch of, obviously got a bunch of products in the store, um, so it's a product catalogue, and it's just a way of filtering down on the types of products that may suit your style or you know your, your colour and all that. So they, um, you know, the, the agency came up with a concept of, of making that a bit more interesting. And we've got this, um, we've got sort of these bubbles, the menu, menu system made out of these bubbles that you can throw around the screen and um, push into each other and bounce off the side, and you can pop the bubbles. Turn. I don't know if you can hear that, hear it at all. Oh dear! <laughs> <laughs> no, I pushed home. No crash. <laughs> so you can you can pop the bubbles and move them around and waste a lot of time without buying anything. And then if you pop them all, more appear and oh, you can have loads of fun or give it to your kids so you can actually do some shopping. I don't know. So or you can really use it and go, oh, okay, you know, I'm a, I'm a lady and I'm looking for let's see some uh, some specialty gene. I'll, come in and look for, I'd like to embrace my curves and select this one and um, I love wearing high boots so I dive into something like that and you finally get to a product. So they've got, um, they've got modelled photographs of all the jeans um, embedded in the app so obviously you see a style of jean here um, and you can scrub your finger along to sort of scrub the product around and see it modelled from all different angles which is probably great for some people and you can pinch and zoom right in and have a good look. <laughs> <laughs> and pan around and zoom out and so on and navigate to different products to look at and the girls will show them off for you and again obviously zoom in um, you've got a, a favorites list so I can tap save to favorites uh, I can switch to a different a wash of jean um, save that and and there's a little information about the, the products and these little bubbles that are popping on the side and just to prove that it's not one style there's also men's jeans, we can jump straight into some style. Anyone? Loose. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll go for something, let's go for something light. So, this guy's really having a lot of fun with his jeans. <laughs> they went to town, oh, I won't zoom in there. Okay. <laughs> so, that, that's the app. So, we'll just... Uh, what I'll, first of all, what I'll do is just tell you who I am so you know who, who's talking to you um, and give you an idea of some of the things um, that, I've, that I've produced and then we'll go into the app in detail. But I'll try and go through it pretty quick. It was supposed to be a lightning talk, but I sort of blew it out a little bit too much. So, but Sean didn't hit me, so I got away with it. Uh, my name's Chris Miles. Um, I'm a freelance iOS um, engineer. Uh, I've got a background in Python, web development, REST services, C, admin and e-commerce and, e and ISP environments. Uh, I've been doing iOS for about two years now. A couple of apps, um, just sort of part of the portfolio, I guess. Uh, one of my recent ones with this iPhone app for the Australian government for their new Swap It, Don't Stop It health campaign. You might have seen ads on TV and I saw one on the side of a tram the other day. So that was a fun little project. Um, another app I did a few years ago now was for the for British Telecom, a directory search app, um, just you know for the public to use the, the BT's um, search for businesses and that sort of thing in your area or your location, that sort of stuff. I uh, just went through these quickly, a little hobby app that basically gives you river statistics and all rivers in New South Wales, um, in the US and more areas as I, as I bother adding them, um, using core plot for a bit of nice little graphs and things there. Um, and a sort of random selection of, of other little projects. 
um, a search library, um, a credit for iOS for the company called Locator and some demo apps for that, a, a, a notes app and some other sort of interesting little prototypes and other mm -hmm. projects. But I'll mainly focus on this Jeans West app today. So like you saw, it's a sort of interactive Jeans browser. Um, the, the idea, the original scope of the project was to to deploy the app in stores on, on iPads that people would come in and pick up and start playing with it, maybe keep them in the store longer. I don't know if it makes them buy more jeans, but that's probably not my problem. Um, and <laughs> they're talking about releasing it in the app store, which might help actually get people seeing the app. And from my understanding, I think it's only in one store at the moment. And it's way over in High Point, which is the other side of the city to me, so I haven't got to have a look at you know my work in action, but um, hopefully I'll, I assume it's there somewhere. Um, so the architecture of the app, I like to describe it as sort of actually more like a game in that um, it's, there's just one main view controller which sets up the whole, which sets up the main view and any static static views, and then the, there's a sort of custom mini framework to handle the scene management between um, focusing in on the as you're as you're selecting bubbles and going down the, the navigation hierarchy and um, navigating between products. Um, so there's a there's a 60 frames per second render loop using the good old CA display link, which is tied into a little physics engine to, ha to handle the bubble simulation. Um, we use uh, used OpenAL for audio to get um, high performance audio for those bubbles <coughs> effects. Very, you know, very important. 32 channel bubbles coming out at you. Um, for graphics, I, ba I just basically use UI Kit um, and Core Graphics. No OpenGL Direct, um, no high-level graphics frameworks like Cocoa Studio or Corona or anything. Really no need. If you already know um, the graphics frameworks already, then use what's there. You get a lot of performance out of it, especially for something relatively simple like this. Um, Core Data for product database. Um, embedded TrueType fonts for the, for the design requirements, as like you can do in 3.2 onwards. Um, and the app was targeted for the iPad 2, but their target was to really launch the app in sort of the day after the iPad 2 release, so all the development was done on iPad 1. So while there was scope there to get to have a lot of room with performance, and it may not seem like there's an issue with performance, but there's some areas that I'll talk about in a minute that were key. Um, I basically made sure it worked. Performance was absolutely fine on iPad One as part of sort of my own criteria. There was also a sub criteria where they may not they may not have been able to get an iPad Two on launch day, like a lot of people didn't. So they might have had to launch it on iPad One, and that wasn't the case. But still, the you know the the scope was. Um, I made sure to develop on, I had to develop an iPad one, so I made sure everything ran absolutely smooth on one. So what I'll run over is just the two main challenges I guess um, I had to deal with with this particular project. One was the bubble physics, um, and one was the large image zoom where you're zooming right in on the product in high, in high resolution. So with the bubble physics, um, like we saw, uh, I'll just I'll jump back and, and show you again because it's, it's fun to play with. If anyone wants to play with it, just come over and grab the iPad later. But yeah, you can so you can put your finger down, pick up any bubble. It's all because it's all based on UI Kit. You, you got all multi-touch, so you can pick three bubbles up with three fingers or any more, and throw them around and flick them across the screen. Um, there's collision detection against sort of the sides, so you can flick them against the sides and and they'll bounce back in and push them against each other. Obviously, they bounce around. Um, there's a bit of in this particular scene. There's a bit of custom collision detection to keep this um, these bubbles they wanted sort of in a. Um, located in a, in a fixed area, so they kind of bounce around a little um, containment circle here. You can sort of pull them right out of that and then flick them back in and have, have a bit of fun with that. And obviously you can pop them and, and that. So that's that's basically the, um, the physics there. So what I ended up using for that was uh, a little physics sort of particle engine from a researcher named Treya. Um, which I think people just call the Treya physics engine. It's basically a, a spring and attraction simulator. Um, so you, well, basically what I've done is defined a, every bubble as a particle um, that is simulated, you know, moving around. It has um, inertia and stuff, so it slow down nicely, or completely configurable. Um, and then what I do is as bubbles sort of start to overlap, I create a spring between them, which tries to then push them apart until they're far enough apart and then destroy the spring as they hit the edges of the containment areas, create more springs to push to pull them back in. So it's really all about, you know, playing around with the spring engine and, and they're letting the engine control the particles and having them move around. Um, uh, actually there was one it's pretty pretty minor, but also added in the, the accelerometer movement. So as I hold it, they'll slowly drift down. It's very subtle. If you, you know move a different way they'll drift them to the side. So just so that they're not sitting still, which is what you get by default. So you get all that very, you get a, it's a very simple 
little engine that you can completely configure into whatever graphical framework and whatever um, rendering engine that, that you need to. So it was it was nice to work with. Um, I, sorry. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. Well, that my one I haven't released it yet. It, basically, it's um, I found it while looking for a, a sort of a looking for a solution to a different problem. Um, in the Flash world, oh, no, I don't work in the Flash world, but I found the solution in the Flash world and found an open source um, AS3 implementation of that engine. So what I had to do was port that over to Objective-C um, and get that running in the in the app framework and ended up running really nicely. So I'll, um, I haven't released that particular port yet, uh, open source, but I plan to when I get some time to tidy it up and add a few more demos. So that was... Um, that was uh, one of the first prototypes. I'll bring up a sort of little app, which is this is the first thing I did to just com com test the um, bubble configuration of the physics engine. So each of the you know each of these circles is just a UI view with corner radius set to make it into a circle. Um, you push them around the same as what I ended up with in the main app, and you pull them out of the the, the big circle is just the, representing the containment area. As you pull them out, they'll jump back in, and as you sort of pull them to overlap, they do overlap. But if you let go, they'll sort of spring apart a little like that. So that's you know, that's really all it's doing. Um, the engine's got a bunch of other cool demos that people have created in the Flash world they haven't ported yet, but I ported this one over. This was kind of originally one of the things I ported over just to test it, which was quite cool. Um, sort of move your finger around and the texture sort of deforms in a funny way like a cockroach running underneath it or something. And if you tap it, it sort of bounces out. If you turn on the grid, you can get a better idea of what's actually going on. So... Um, if you can see the, that clearly, there's a the blue grid basically represents every for every horizontal and vertical cross point. That's a particle. Um, where you put your finger, it sets up a repulsion force which tries to push the blue particles away. I call them blue. Um, but the red lines represent springs that are there to try and drag that um, particle back to its origin point. So you kind of get a you know funny little effect there that's a bit fun to play with. Um, oops! If you turn off the image, you can probably see it clearly what's going on. So that's kind of a first um, demo I ported across just to sort of obviously prove that it's actually working properly and to, you know, impress friends and mm. get women and all that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the physics engine taken care of. Um, the other problem that's um, probably of more interest to normal iOS developers, I guess, is the, the large image zoom. <laughs> It needed a lot of testing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just jump in and uh, we'll just remember what that's all about. Um, I'll just pick some things. So, yeah, we'll, you know, for every, for every product, we pick a random frame and we zoom in on it. So, every photograph of the model is actually a, a, a full screen image even though the main, the main guts of the image is really the, the, the part where the model's standing, there's all lighting that fades out and design wanted, we have to use the full image, we can't crop it out or whatever, so fair enough. So there's a 1024 by 768 image for um, sort of 20 frames of, of panning, scrubbing between them, and for every one of those frames you can zoom in to a four times zoom scale. So there's a bunch, you know, there's a bunch of images under the hood um, and the zoom had to be obviously very responsive. You start zoom, you start pinching, and it zooms in immediately. So it sounded relatively straightforward, um, but in reality, it was it was a bit more challenging than that. So just to describe the problem space, there were there's 42 products in, in this particular um, app. Each product has 20 of those full screen frames that you can scrub between, and every frame can be zoomed into a four times scale sort of high resolution image of 4096 by 3072. So in total you're starting out with 840 normal screen size images and 844 fourth time scale images. So the first mini problem was fast scrubbing between um, the full, free, full screen frames. So really to, to get the performance there to scrub between them you had to keep the images in, in RAM. So the, the straightforward method actually worked well. I just create an array of UI images, I load them in with image with contents of file, keep them in RAM, scrub between them and just replace the image and it's absolutely fine. They fit in RAM, it's high performance and you know no problem there. Um, made sure to use image with contents of file rather than image named because image named keeps a cache of images under the hood 
which sounds like it could be good, but it actually isn't aggressive about cleaning out that cache, and you quickly run out of RAM, especially for large, um, large images. So I just load the images as I need them for a particular scene, and then throw them away and load the ones for the next scene, and that's all, that's all handled quite quickly and nicely. Chris, did you try um, a kind of sort of file of map file? Just see, or no, no. Um, there's a new API on, uh, on UI image, which is well, maybe it's but where it'll give you uh, uh, a memory map file rather yeah. than loading it into memory because uh, flash ram is pretty fast. I think I, I think I did. I tried a few variations on and other ideas where you you really because image oh, UI image really doesn't want to load the image. It really, really doesn't want to load the image off storage until you're actually about to display it, until Gore Graphics or whatever needs to display it. And I tried some tricks to really force it to, to bring them in. And I, for, I remember seeing that one, and I can't remember if I tried it. I, th I think I might have. But anyway, it didn't really make a difference in the end because just that image, um, just that image of contents of file, as the scene loads, it loads them all in, and then as you scrub, it's fine. It was, I don't remember the, the exact numbers, it was. Probably pushing it for an iPad one. It wasn't using up the whole um, 256, but it was starting to be the dominant. Obviously, the dominant app in memory. You, you wouldn't want to push it. You wouldn't want to push too many more um, large, um, large frame images into RAM. You're saying it's 20, 20 images. Yeah, 20 um, full screen images. Yeah, 20 which, but I think they end up as, as textures. They end up larger. So yeah. But their simple solution ended up working well for this particular case. Mm. Especially as you're scrubbing across, you've got enough, you've really, uh, there's probably, a, you know, fractions of a delay, a delay that work well enough with the way you're scrubbing. One of my early implementations was like a, uh, a, a sort of pan, uh, scrub and, and let go accel acceleration, so the image would quick go, would change frames fast and then slow down. And that required a bit more, maybe something like memory mapping or something really to drag them in, force them into memory. Um, but anyway, for this particular case, that's that's what worked. The, more of the problem, though, was really about getting that um, zoomed image um, displaying without any lag. So the naive implementation was basically as the user starts pinching, load the the four times scale image um, into into memory and start scaling it on screen. But the the lag between <coughs> starting to pinch and actually getting that image loaded in and starting to display it was was just too much. It was it was good at half a second or something. Something that was noticeable enough to be just, you know, this is no, no good for a user experience. And the other problem, especially on iPad 1, was that often you just run out of memory. I think the, the 20 full screen images in, in memory plus this four times one was just, was just pushing it now and then it would crash. So the, you know, the simple problem comes down to, um, you know, the image was simply too slow to appear as you started to pinch and there was just not enough memory available to throw all these large scale images around. So the answer, which is probably obvious to some people, is to use CA Tiled Layer. So um, you know, I guess for those fairly new to the platform, the HUI view is backed by a core animation layer that's, that's quite um, you know, low, layer, low layer close to the GPU. And some of the CA layers available are special purpose ones like CA Tiled Layer. So what you get to do with this one is to give it um, basically a bunch of multiple zoom scales, images at multiple um, zoom scales and sliced up into tiles and it handles automatically working out which zoom scale and which tiles to display on screen for the current scale factor and the current crop rectangle and as you pan around or move the re crop rectangle and as you scale it loads and, and, and juggles the images around and you get a lot of uh, good performance out of that. So sort of graphically in a fairly crappy diagram but this is what um, this is what we end up using the top image is the 1024x768, the full screen image. The second one is the two times, and the bottom one is the four times. And each of those images are chopped up into 512 by 512 pixel tiles. And you can maybe vaguely see the, the slice ups. So that solution, you have a quick bit of testing with CA tiled layer showed that that solution really worked well. Um, however, then, then it generated a problem of actually um, slicing up all of our images into all, all the all the resolutions and tiles that we needed. So just to paint that picture, I guess, obviously, as I said, we need three zoom scales, and each of those zoom scales um, chopped up into 512 by 512 pixel tiles. 
So at zoom scale 1 there's 4 tiles, at zoom scale 2 there's 12 tiles and at zoom scale 3 there's 48 tiles. So that means we need 64 tiles per 4 times frame which is 1280 tiles per product and 53, nearly 54,000 tile images in total for the whole product set. Um, and that come out to about 1.2 gig of storage which isn't a problem in itself but it's just a, a lot of fun managing that. Sorry? Tricky, but you know, achievable. They've got the two gig limits, so you can get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, we are going to cut that down when they do the App Store. They realise that that is um, theoretically feasible, but not practical. So, yeah. So, Chris, do you actually have to split up the images yourself, or do you give one big image and just provide the dimensions for the location of the file? No, you have to slice them up. You have to give Sour Todd layer the, the, the slices. It'd be nice if you just gave it the image and it handled it, but... You said there's how many tiles on it. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, no. Ah, well, let's look, look at the next slide. So... <laughs> so <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, if, <laughs> well, firstly, so I worked out, okay, prototype that solution. It worked really well, so I threw it back at the design guys. Can you do your Photoshop, Photoshop batch magic and just slice all these up for me? They came back the next one. Do you realise that's 53,000 images? And we worked it out. If we get these three junior guys to do it, it's going to take us three weeks. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought, well, I'd been expecting that answer anyway. So I'd already thought of my solution. I said, don't worry, leave it with me. So all, what I ended up doing was, was basically, yeah, I whipped to get together my own OS 10 command line little utility using all the Cocoa image manipulation magic as a, a sample of the, I guess, the, the more important um, uh, classes and methods I used to, to do the image chop up. Basically, it ended up taking a good. Uh, I think in the end, it sort of sort of took a two hours to run on a pretty modern iMac. So you know, basically run through every 4x image, scale it to three resolutions, chop all them up, write them all back out. A pretty short bit of code in the end, but it worked really well, and it made the design guys go, "Ooh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you're really good." Um, one problem. One problem that did take me a little bit of time to work out, though, with this one is to is to carry the colour space of the original images across to the to the bloody tiles. So the original images that come from Design are all Adobe RGB colour space, and normally you don't even think about this sort of thing; you totally ignore it. But when I produced the first lot of tiles and we had a look, they realised that just, that just doesn't look right. You compare it to the original one; the tints are wrong. And this, I'm going to bloody you know what, what's going on? But by default, the you know, image or the you know the Cocoa version of, of that stuff would produce um, a device RGB colour map. So it took me a while to, I haven't really done much of, of actual OS 10 on mainly iOS stuff, so I had to work out how to actually pull in the colour map from the, or the colour space from the original images and carry that through. And in the end, well it looks easy in the end, but end up with this sort of one down here, um, NS bitmap image rep, who's got an, a bitmap image rep by converting to colour space with rendering intent. So that was the magic for that one. And finally the design guys were happy and I could move on. So, so to summarise, um, Physics engines are fun, as you probably, as many of you probably already know. Um, there's a lot of interesting littler engines out there. There's obviously your Box 2Ds and your Chipmunks and the cool um, rigid physics engines, but there's also a bunch of other ones for different cases, so have a play with them. There seems to be a lot in the, in, the, um, in the Flash world. I don't do any Flash, but I start looking there more for interesting graphical experiments and things. Um, for your graphics, don't be afraid to push your kit and call graphics. Don't go straight to your Cocos 2Ds or straight to OpenGL perhaps until you've really pushed core graphics because you can get away with heaps. Especially if this one was relatively simple, but you know there was no point over engineering it. CA so yeah, tiled layer rocks as, you, as most of you well know. Um, and don't forget to impress your design team by scripting up some m complex image manipulation magic using your Coco um, talent. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thanks, man. Any, any questions? Yeah. Yep. Have you played with CR tile layer in regular display devices? Uh, I'll say no. <laughs> I fiddled with a little bit, and that's what's. I mean, I, I've used CR tile layer as well to solve like graphics loading problems and zooming problems, and it works awesome on old devices or iPads. You bring it to regular display devices, and the screen scale and the core graphics stuff underneath means that it's zooming two times more than it should be. And things it's actually doing twice as much work on this extra mental scale. Yeah. And I, I've managed to solve it eventually, but I just found that that was a big hurdle. And with the lack of documentation on how to actually manage that, even though Apple do the whole like dealing with high res displays, 
doesn't help. No, they give you the basics. Yeah. But I've I've I had to, I've played around with custom CA layers, and you know it's the same problem space. You've got to really work out what scale you're rendering for, and I've, basically now I've solved it. But I don't remember how. I just pull a code out I use every time for that sort of thing. It's actually um, in the um, for in the 2010 WWDC uh, session videos. There's a section on, on core graphics and core animation and stuff. And one of the uh, suggestions is to get out of Retina display mode, doing everything for you, is to put a a layer in your layer hierarchy at the very bottom, which half scales everything, um, and then everything's in native red. So, oh yeah. Um, yeah. So that way. You just Reverting what they're doing for you automatically. Um, <coughs> so uh, you know, the app, the UX is pretty incredible. As everybody could, should should agree. Um, did you work with a team of UX people that, that uh, helped you uh, get to that, or did you do some of that yourself? I was given the the I was basically given the design and the concept. Um, docs to say this is we want bubbles and there was a left open. <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's the photoshops with all the bubbles in them. So off you go. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. That's extra impressive. It was fun. It was a fun project. That's why I wanted to show it. Yep. <laughs> I only the actual image zooms, although it is full um, full screen. But because the interesting part is only really this half, the model, I I lock the zooming to be sort of once you start panning, it doesn't really let you pan over to the black area, to the mostly black area, just for better you know better user experience. Well, you're still loading that image as an, even, even as an atlas into into memory, so I think it's the same problem. Because if it's a one-off, you know, an atlas can be pretty large, and if it's a one-off, that's fine. You know, when you're loading the level or whatever, if it's a game style thing, that's fine. But for this case, for every every um, pan frame, there's a 4x image tied to that, so you can't have them preloaded. You have to wait till they start actually panning, of pinching with their finger, before you go. Well, quick, you know, grab, drag this in, and I basically. For this case, as soon as there's no CA tile layer there, as soon as I start pinching, I throw one over the top and configure it for the tiles, and then let it start scaling. And it, and it actually is a little bit behind. On iPad one, you could only you just notice it a little bit. This is a two, um, so it actually scales along with the original 1024 by 768 image, and so it pixelates a little bit just before CA tile layer slams down the better resolution tile on top. You made a comment about having one overall UI view controller and then managing your own scene stuff. Yep. In that. I guess, why did you do that and what are the advantages and sort of limitations of, of doing an app like that? And what, what's the kind of sweet spot for, for doing that than, than using multiple view controllers? I think if, if Apple had a like, UI navigation hierarchy with bubble physics engine class. <laughs> I would have dived straight in and used that. But the, the navigation was custom. I mean, it, I say uh, there's no real navigation hierarchy to use, but, but it all still uses UI kit. So even the bubble, every bubble is just a UI view. It's as simple as that. It's a custom drawn UI view, but that's all it is moving around. Um, all, you know, all these things are just labels and UI views for this. Obviously, this one's pretty straightforward. So it's just really managing, um, pulling apart the views and, and changing them as, as you go. It could probably be, you know, this one could probably be a navigation controller on its own. Because I'd already sort of built uh, a, minim a minimal scene management system, it's very simple, but un under the hood it was easy enough to just say, okay, now this scene is, is this thing and, and it would pop itself up. It's doing a little bit of the work for um, a UI view controller, but, but far less than, it, than, than a UI view controller would need to do. So I guess if it's there, there is a bit of crossover, and it just depends what what sort of um, scene management you need to need to handle. So if you get a memory warning, are you going under the hood and working out what's visible, what's not, throwing away views, or is it to a point where you didn't need to worry about that? Well, I didn't really need to worry about it. The the scene every um, every scene where there's a bubbles on and there's a choice that's the equivalent of a UI view controller, but in my little scene management system. Mm -hmm. When you 
hit a bubble to go to a next scene, it, it sort of there's a there's a bunch of you know there's a bunch of um, framework methods to pull that scene apart, throw the next scene up, same as view did load and view did unload sort of thing. So the equivalence there, the actual memory problem wasn't an issue for those for that part of the management. So I didn't have to do that, but I made sure that only one scene was was rendered at one time, and each scene was was torn down, and and the, the objects managing that were thrown away. Yeah. Many thanks to Chris for giving us a sneak peek at his excellent iPad application. Visit Chris on the web at chrismiles.info. Thanks also to PlayUp for hosting this month's event. If you would like to know more about PlayUp, visit them on the web at iplayup.com. If you would like to know more about Melbourne Cocoa Heads, Visit us on the web at melbournecocoheads.com or follow Melbourne Coco on Twitter. Damn, this is good dope.